the East Side Church of Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're here because of the love of God, who allowed Jesus to die on the cross of Calvary, to be buried, and yet we're here not only to remember him in that way, but to celebrate him as our risen Lord, our risen Savior, as an act of love. I'm wearing red this morning because here at Eastside, this is our red Sunday. We also think about those with heart problems, cancer. And also it's a time that we have for the ladies. They celebrate their fellowship one with another with the red, with the love team, which will be coming up this, this evening. We're thankful that you're able to join us we pray as we worship together, that you gather your Bible, gather your material, your cups, and your communion cup, and get ready for a day of worship and praise. And so we're thankful, and we lift our hearts and our minds up for those who are sick and afflicted. In a special way, we lift up the Pete family and others. And so this morning, we just want to give thanks unto the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us allowing us to gather this morning to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, we pray in a special way for uh, the Pete family, be with Sister Pete, be, be with her ha husband, be with that family in a special way. We pray for those who are sick among us, those who are bereaved, and Father, we just lift you up as we come together to worship in spirit and truth. Bless this worship service. Help us to focus on the love you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to focus on the love we have for one another. Help us to focus simply on glorifying you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say, Amen. Jesus, my heavenly King, love me. I know and praise it. To him I sing on the word. I go, but closely to him I cling, but let saints still flow, because I love my Savior too, you know that I, I love my Savior, and he, he loves, loves me too.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the first book of Samuel, chapter 18. We'll be reading verse 1 through verse 9. Again, that's 1 Samuel, chapter 18, beginning at verse 1 and ending at verse 9. And the Bible reads, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened that as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and to the listening of the Lord's word. Now let us all please stand for prayer. Let us pray. To our eternal God and Father, we come to you, Heavenly Father, just thanking you for allowing us to wake up and see this day. We thank you for your blessings, for the grace and the mercies rain down upon us each and every day. We come thanking you for the sacrifice and the love that is your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came down on this earth to die on the cross so that we may have a chance at eternal salvation. We come thanking you, Heavenly Father, simply for uh, the love and the fellowship that is the Eastside Church of Christ. Uh, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with this congregation, continue to bind us together, uh, continue to watch over us, continue to keep us. We come now asking that you just be with those that are in, in need of you at this time, Heavenly Father. Those who have come in need of prayer, Heavenly Father, dealing with health issues, dealing with life issues, dealing with work issues, uh, just dealing with everyday trials and tribulations. We know you can solve all, Heavenly Father, so we, we turn it all over to you. At this time, Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with uh, Brother Jones as he comes before us on this morning. Uh, we simply ask that you give him a ready recollection of those things which he has studied so he may come before us and part those truths unto us as we need it on our Christian journeys. We ask that you be with us. Uh, we ask that you guide us, forgive us of all of our shortcomings and all of our sins. It is in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. I'm 
say good morning again God uh, has blessed us to see another Lord's Day we thank him so much for all that he's done here in Oklahoma we're starting to experience a little snow and we thank God even for the snow because you know he knows what we need and he always bless us according to our needs uh, as Paul said uh, according to his riches in glory uh, this morning we want to uh, um, direct our attention uh, to the 18th chapter of first Samuel the first book of Samuel the 18th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1, commence reading to verse 9. That's 1 Samuel 18, verse 1 through verse 9. What well, the scripture says, and it was so, when he had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David. And went his armor even to his sword and his bow and his belt. The scripture says in verse 5, And so David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servant. Now it had happened as they uh, were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, uh, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul have slain his thousand and David his ten thousand. Then Saul was angry, very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but a thousand. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? 
Verse 9, so saw I David from that day forward. On last Sunday, as a nation, we were able to witness the uh, history being made by old 43-year-old man by the name of Tom Brady. And everybody is around here talking about he is the GOAT. He is the greatest of all time. And we, we understand that. You know, for 43 years old, and you out there, these young bucks are hitting you and banging all day long. You, you got to be good to be able to stay in the game that long. You know, and, and it seems like in every sport arena you can imagine, we're talking about how great people are, you know, in basketball, Mike was the, Michael Jordan was the GOAT, and Kobe was the GOAT, and LeBron is the GOAT now, and uh, in baseball, uh, Jackie Robinson was a GOAT. Uh, Hank Aaron was a GOAT. Even when it come down to boxing, they said that Muhammad Ali was the greatest of all time, and Joe Lewis, but I stopped by this morning to tell you about God's goat. We want to use this as a topic this morning, God's goat. Now, I'm not talking about a, a physical goat like a goat in, in, in the barnyard. But God has some great people in his arsenal. In our reading this morning of the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel, it talks about a young man by the name of David. David being the son of Jesse, having been anointed and chosen by God in 1 Samuel 16. David was a young man, and you know, it's amazing how God will use whatever he need to use to accomplish whatever he set out to accomplish. And, 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 and you know, when you think about it, uh, David was a young man that was only a shepherd boy. But God had used many different type of people. He always seemed like he used simple people to do uh, spectacular feats. But this morning, we want to look at the life of David and see what made David so great. And, and it seemed like every time you were in David's presence, you were in the presence of greatness. David was the GOAT. He was the greatest at his time of all time. Um, it started out when it, in, in verse uh, 17, it says that David had returned from slaughter of the Philistines. He and, and Abner, his brother Abner, had taken him to, to Saul. And he had, when he, when, he, when he went to Saul's house, he had the head of uh, Goliath in his hand. And so Saul asked, who is this boy? Who is this boy's daddy? And they talked about how he was the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, uh, and, and that he uh, was a man of God. And so as the story goes on, the Bible says that Saul was so impressed with David. Saul had taken a liking to David, and the Bible said that he wouldn't even allow David to go back to his daddy's house. And not only did Saul fall in love with him, but Saul had a son by the name of Jonathan. And Jonathan, for some strange reason, you know, it seems like there are people that you gravitate to. And so David and Jonathan, the Bible said that they were so much in love with one another that their souls were like knitted together. That's how close they were. It'd be great if we can get God's people to knit themselves together like that. And as old folk used to say, one would never be able to fall f f because of the other. But I'm, I want to ask all of us this question. How do we count greatness? Do we count it by the money that people have in the bank? You know, a lot of times, if you don't have money, people won't too much mess with you. Uh, do, we, do we count it by, by the talent that we have? You know, because for some strange reason, we categorize people in our society and put them on pedestals when they have talent. And the man that does not uh, be, be notarized, uh, or he doesn't get that notoriety, we, we don't look at him too much. You know, people talk about how good Tom Brady was, but you know, Tom Brady had an offensive line people don't too much talk about. They were the goats too. They were the great ones too. Do we look at greatness by the house people live in? Do we look at greatness in our theatrical world because if a person wins an Oscar, you know, they, they're the greatest. We look at Sidney Poitier, we look at Harry Belafonte, we, we look at Cicely Tyson who least recently left here. God's greatness is different from man's greatness. And I've always said that true greatness is not measured by what you have in this life, but it's how you live this life. See, see you can have everything in this world, but if you're not great in the sight of God, your greatness is almost null and void because man's greatness will not save you. But God's greatness will carry you from here to eternity. I like the way God in Job 1 and 8, when he told Satan, when he had that confrontation with Satan, and he told Satan, he said, have you considered my servant Job? Why, God? Because he's a great man. He's a great man. He was God's goat at that time. 
And so when we look at the life of David and we think about David as a king, David, it's amazing how he was a king, but David was the type of king that he knew that God's spirit dwelt in him. And so as we look at this text and we see how David's life unfolds, we look at, first of all, that David, I like the way David as a king knew how to behave himself. In verse 5, the Bible says that David went out wherever Saul sent him, and he behaved himself in such a way that everybody noticed David. But you know, it's amazing how sometimes when other people see greatness in us, we can't always see it in ourselves. And so David's life was a life of walking, uh, uh, properly a life of a person that knew how to carry themselves. And that's something we in the church have to know how to carry ourselves because people are constantly watching how we live. They're looking for consistency. They're looking for us to be solid from core to circumference. Talking about the way David talked when uh, he was out amongst people, the way uh, he lived, the way he, he, he spoke, and the way he portrayed himself as not only a king, but a representative for God. David's life was unfolding here as a young man, a young man. God has chosen to be king over the nation of Israel. And now you have to look at David in, in, in three aspects. First of all, David behaved himself well in spite of his promotion. You see, sometimes people can't take, uh, people can't take promotions too well. Pe pe people can't take popularity too well. So David, here's the shepherd boy that was an anointed man, and David knew he was anointed, and he was not only anointed, but he had did something that a lot of grown men didn't do. He defeated the champion of Philistia. He killed Goliath. David went from a shepherd to a warrior. David went from a shepherd, just a common old nobody, to somebody because he was Israel warrior. Not only did he behave himself in spite of being promoted, but David was one of those people, he was able to handle uh, this, 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 this quick uh, elevation to, to, to uh, what you might say, to a popular status. Because let me tell you something, what God would do to us, he will allow us a victory, but he have to give it to some of us a little bit at a time because we can't take too much at once. It'll go to our head. We're the first thing we would be saying. You know, I went down there and that giant, you know, he called me out and, you know, and I had to do this and I had to do that. That wasn't David's attitude. That was not David's attitude. You see, sometimes we got to understand, even in the church, we as leaders, we, we brag a lot about what we do. You know, all you have to do is just do it. God knows, God knows your works. He told the church over in Sardis in the third chapter of the book of Revelation, he said, I know your work. He said, you got a name, but you're dead. What are you saying, Brother Jones? That if you want to be God's goat, just do what God tell you and allow God to toot your horn. My daddy used to say, you never toot your horn because sometimes you always pitch it too high. What are you saying, Jones? That David behaved himself in such a way to where it made God Please, and not only that, the people around David seen how he had been elevated to, 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 to a king's status. He behaved himself in such a way to where in spite of all of the things that was going on in his life, you know, David had problems. You know, you can be a Christian and still function even with the problems that you have. That's why James admonishes us in James 1 and 2. He said, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing that the trying of your faith work patience. What are you saying, brother preacher? That even as a child of God, you're going to have problems, but you still got to keep working for God and pressing forward. David did not allow Saul, who attempted to kill him, to slow him down in doing God's work. David had a chance once before with this problem. You know, Saul, he got jealous. If you look at the text, the Bible says that when the women came out, let me tell you something. When those women came out, they were singing that one, one hit wonder. David did a 10,000, but Saul, he just a thousand. He just had a thousand. And for some strange reason, his attitude was one that allowed him to allow anger to overwhelm him. Instead of saying, if it was me, I would have said, yeah, me and David went kill 11,000 of those rascals. But he allowed what the women said to cause him to be angry 
at David. What are you saying, brother preacher? That sometimes, sometimes we will allow other people's prosperity and other people's blessings to cause us to lose focus. David had a chance to kill Saul, but you know what he told him? David snuck, if you look at the 24th chapter of 1 Samuel, David went into the cave when, when Saul was chasing him and Saul had to have a bathroom break. And so what David did, he, he didn't hurt Saul because he had the mindset, you are God's anointed and I will not put my hands on you. But what David did, he cut the bottom of his robe and he said, if I wanted you, I could have got you. You ever had somebody in a position you know you can hurt them and you know you got them probably where you wanted them, but you said, I won't put my hands on you because I know you're a child of God. That was David's attitude. In spite of the problems that David was running to, in spite of all the trouble David went through, in spite of the popularity and the promotion that David had, David still behaved himself as a king. He behaved himself well in spite of life possibilities. You know, you know, it, 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 it's something. You know, when 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 you have some pull and you have some some ploy, and, and and Saul was king, but you know what? David could have pulled rank on him, but David allowed him to do whatever he wanted to do because David knew, you know, your kingship is only temporary. It's not a lifetime thing. David knew that God was with him. He knew. That Saul was only renting that crown, you might say. But the crown was his eternally. I stopped by this morning to tell you, David was a young man, but he had it together. As a young man, he had it, he had it together. There's one thing I love to see young men, especially young black men, that really have it together, that has an education, that has good manners, that know how to carry themselves, that love humanity, that respect their parents, that goes places in life. Let me tell you something. Character will get you in the, I mean, uh, reputation will get you in the door, but character will keep you in the door. David was a man of character. Great as a young man. Popular as a young man, had his priorities all together. It, was, it wasn't about material things with David. And David was a humble young man because David's life, if you look in verse 10, David had surrendered his life to God. The Bible says, and it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit uh, from God came upon Saul and David prophesied inside the house. So they uh, 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 prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hands as the other times, but there was a spear in, in, in Saul's hand. In other words, David was playing under duress and Saul could have killed him, but it didn't stop David from doing what David knew God wanted him to do. When Saul got hot, David playing music cooled him down. David knew that a king was against him. He knew that the king walked into the room, but he knew that once he picked up that harp and started to play, that spirit that Saul had, it would calm him down. You know, sometimes we have folk in the church that has that Saul spirit about themselves. And Paul said that the strong got a bad infirmities of the week, Romans 15 1. Every once in a while, you got to pull out that spiritual harp and then maybe sing a song and calm some of God's people down because sometimes we allow the wrong spirit to dwell in us and thus we lose our greatness. As David had, David was steadfast. You know, even though Saul hated him, and he knew that he was trying to kill him. David, the Bible says in verse 11, from that day forward, David watched and he kept his eye on Saul. He had to, you know, sometimes you got to watch folks sometimes. You got to be careful. You got to be extremely careful. David, David was not only uh, was he steadfast, not only was David surrendered, but David was submissive. Even though Saul tried to kill him. He did not stop doing what was right. You know, sometimes people can say things to us in the church and we'll quit, we'll give up. You know, I just soon not do it no more, you know, because they criticize me. You know what criticism does to me? It makes me work all the more harder. Let me tell you something. Whenever you tell me that I can't do it, I'm going to show you that by the grace of God, and by the power that God has placed in me, that I can do it. David did not let Saul stop David from being David. Hmm, average, average one of us today. We see, or rather, we do things that's important for us. 
Those things that we attach value to determine the priorities of our lives. In other words, if it's important to me, that's what I'm going to do. What about God's program? When are we going to stop seeing the importance of, of, of our prayer life and importance of our Bible study and importance in witnessing God's word to other people? That should be priority in our lives. David had his stuff together. He was submissive. He was steadfast. And not only that, he had surrendered his will to God's will. That's what made gave David the goat that he was, the greatest of all time. And let me tell you something. And David knew as a king, people was watching him. In verse 5, look what, it, look what it said about David, that the men that Saul had set over him had accepted David, that the people of Israel accepted David. People had fell in love with David. Why? Because in his private life, there was a certain perception that people had of David. You see, Saul hated David, wanted him to die. But the thing about it, this young man was ambitious. And let me tell you something about ambition. No matter what people do, it can't stop you from doing God's will. That's why I tell all the preachers, watch your, 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 the, the way we carry ourselves, because some old preachers get jealous of younger preachers. David was, and see, this is what happened with Saul. Saul got jealous of David. David did something that Saul couldn't do. Brethren, sometimes we get to a point in our lives, we can't do what we used to do. That's why it's good to train our young men to take over and start doing what we're not able and capable of doing anymore. We ought to be proud instead of being jealous of those that God have anointed. Because let me tell you something, all of us at one time or another is going to come to the end of our journey. No, I can't preach like I used to preach, but I do the best that I can. I say like Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. David understood that he could do something that Saul couldn't do. And, and what God really got to Saul in his public life, people were in love with David. They were, they were crazy about them some David. Saul's servants, they were really impressed with David. All of his subjects, even his son and his daughter, they were crazy about them some David. You know, when we start living our lives in such a way and folks start loving us, we'd be almost like a rock star in the church. You know, people be glad to see you. And that's how it was with David. David did not allow uh, what was going on around him to deter him and stop him from being the person that he ought to be. And guess what? He, the, the personal perception that people had about David was the same perception David had about himself. David loved him some David. But you know what I noticed in this text? He loved God even more. There's nothing wrong with having a positive mental attitude about yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, Saul, you can't love anybody else. What's the lesson and what's the blessing? All around us every day if you look, it's people that wants to know how great we really are by the lives that we live. There are people around us that is looking for love. There are people that are looking for acceptance. There are people that are looking to know how much you know doesn't mean anything. People want to know whether you care, not how much you know. David showed how much he cared. Everywhere that David went, people loved them some David. David understood that Jesus said in Luke 17 and 10 that after you've done all that you can do, you are still an unprofitable servant. I like the way Solomon said in Proverbs 27 and 2. He said, let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. David wasn't looking for accolades. David wasn't looking for people to pat him on the back. Let me tell you something, I'm not looking for an Academy Award. I'm not looking to be notarized. But as long as God has validated me, and they say, you know, you're all right. As long as I hear that well done, thou good and faithful servant, that's what I'm looking for. Solomon again said in Proverbs 26 and 12, he says, see thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Whenever you start thinking that you are more than what you really are. You remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10 and 12. 
He said, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but we measure ourselves by ourselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. The person who toots his own horn get more attention and recognition is not a wise man. The man that puts self before God, puts self before anything that God have commissioned him to do, he's not a goat. God bless you and God keep you. We're not looking to be notarized and notified or whatever you might want to say by men. We want God to validate us with Jesus did on Calvary. We want him to justify us, and he's already done that through his blood. Continue to walk in God's way. Continue to be like David. Don't allow things around you to cause you to lose focus. Just keep working for the Lord and keep pushing. God bless you and God keep you. I trust that your day uh, is, is a good day. Today is uh, considered also a Valentine's Day. I'm going to say happy Valentine's to all of y'all that's in love out there. Uh, so, some of y'all might not get a kiss, but today enjoy it while you get it. We just thank God so much for life, and we should love one another in spite of whatever day it is. Love should be a 365-day thing, not just a February 14th. We love you. We, we ask God to continue to smile on you and just watch yourself as you live your life. Just be like David. Behave yourself in such a way to where God can use you every day, every day. Thank you so much, and God bless you. We've now come down to the communion. During this portion of the worship service, we as Christians assemble together to partake of the Christ's broken body and shed blood. And we do this on the first day of the week in accordance with Acts chapter 20 and verses 7. We find how we do this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. Where we find Paul talking to the early Christians in Corinth, and Bible states, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, ye do show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, who shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh Unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are sick, many are weak, and sickly among you, and many sleep. And we find the reason, the commandment for this in John chapter 6 and the verses 53. And Jesus says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly and Merciful Father, Lord, we thank you for just allowing us to be able to uh, worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. We just thank you for all your many blessings, all your grace, your patience, your mercy, your love. And we just thank you so much that you sent Christ down on the cross that, that we may have a chance of salvation. Lord, we just want to thank you for uh, the bread that represents Christ's broken body and, and the cup that represents his shed blood. Uh, Lord, we just uh, pray that everyone who partakes in this uh, will have the right frame of mind and they will have their mind totally focused on you and that you will hinder anything that will keep them from doing so. Uh, continue to, uh, to watch us, keep us, uh, forgive us of our sins and shortcomings, and in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. In remembrance of your body. In remembrance of your blood, your blood, I'm partaking of the bread, the bread, and I'm drinking of the
Cause the dead I could not pay We've now come down to another part of our morning uh, worship service, uh, which is labeled as giving. Uh, the Lord leads us in an example, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. It says, uh, now concerning the collector for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in stores. God has prospered them, that there be no gatherings when I come. So at this time, we ask that you give what's, uh, what's on your heart. We understand that uh, things are not what they used to be uh, because of the pandemic, and we truly appreciate your efforts to continue to give um, for, our, for our ministries and, and just for the work of the kingdom. Uh, let's go to God in prayer at this time. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much uh, for what you've done and what you're going to do in our lives, Father. We just ask you to continue to, uh, just continue to be with us, continue to uh, just, just watch over our lives, Father. We understand that things are, things are, are, are pretty catastrophic right now, Father. We just, we just, we just need you to, to intervene on our lives. Uh, be with those that are struggling right now. Be with those that are, 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 who, are who, who just don't have the means of, uh, to, to give, Father. Just bless their heart, bless their lives. We just thank you for those that are, are able to give simply because of what you do, Father. Uh, we just thank you and we love you. In your name we pray, amen. We thank everyone for tuning in this morning. We pray that everyone is safe and dry and uh, staying out of this bad weather. Um, at this time, we will recite our congregational prayer, and then the day will be yours. And it goes, Father, help us this week in everything that we do to allow our light to shine so that others may see your good works. Help us to grow together as one family, in one faith, sharing one focus. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone be blessed.